which is a great mission. And um, we're thankful that we have her and appreciate you being here today. So I'm, I'm always excited to come and talk to this group. You are always so energetic and receptive to, to, what, um, to what I have to say and what I have to bring. I did just start sending around um, some pretty big piles of brochures. If you'd like to take one, you're more than welcome to. But what those are, of course, is a park brochure. If you've not been to Prophetstown or it's been a while since you've been to Prophetstown, you can see some of the changes that are being made there. The other brochure is the first 100 years. Boy, I see in the back that you are also celebrating your 100 year anniversary. Holy mackerel, does, can anybody tell me the other centennials and bicentennials happening this year? State of Indiana is 200. National parks are 100. State parks are 100. Indianapolis Motor Speedway is 100. Holy mackerel, what an amazing year. You know, it's, it's, um, again, 100th anniversary for the Flossmore, Illinois Country Club. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> oh, very good. He's celebrating right along with them, so. It happens to be such a great year because, of course, 200 years ago we became a state, the state of Indiana, and every 100 years you get to celebrate some other gift that has happened. You know, at the centennial 100 years ago, more things were celebrated and, and organized groups and committees. And so now that we are another 100 years later, uh, we're getting to celebrate all over again. So we're really proud that the Indiana State Park System is turning 100 along with the National Park Service. And so this brochure is going to tell you, if you didn't know a lot about our Indiana State Park System, you'll know a little bit, bit more. And we're really excited to share that. You might notice if you visit some of our state parks this year that we are all wearing a commemorative badge. In the 1940s, when some of the first naturalists were hired to be at our state parks, they wore this almost sheriff-like badge. And so for our centennial celebration, we had these badges made uh, that celebrate the 1916 to 2016 centennial celebration of state parks. So if you visit your state park, my hope is you see one of these on everybody because we're uh, really excited and proud to be in our state park system. And the last brochure that you are more than welcome to take with you, of course, is a spring wildflowers brochure. And that's kind of what I was asked to bring to you to today and talk about. And I really just um, am hoping that you will enjoy just a picture presentation. Obviously, we're not out on the trail today, but I thought I would bring some photos of the flowers with me. And many of you might know these flowers. Are there a lot of you out there? I know there's at least a couple of you. Yeah, someone's pointing in this direction. I was going to point in this direction too. Somebody might know a lot of these wildflowers. And I have really grown to love wildflowers. If you met me the last time I was here, does anybody remember what topic I talked Turkey about last vultures. time? Turkey vultures, excellent. I grew up loving animals. If it was furry or feathered or slimy or dirty, I loved it. I wouldn't say that I fell in love with flowers growing up. Sure, I thought they were pretty. You know, maybe I picked a dandelion or two. But it wasn't until I got to work at state parks and I realized that my love of animals turned into being able to work at state parks where the nature is so beautiful and being able to work at state parks where the nature is so beautiful and the history is just as dynamic that I started to learn about wildflowers because wildflowers in and of themselves are beautiful to start with. If you want to go a step further and get to be a nature nerd like me or maybe Sam, um, we love flowers because they have really fun botanical and horticultural fun facts. They do things for insects and animals. And of course, they do things for people. And so now that I work at Prophetstown State Park, a park that has a great human history to it, we get to find out that these plants are not just beautiful to look at, they're not just nutritious for animals, but they are also nutritious and important to people. And so that has just exploded my love of flowers. Beauty first, that's what I tell people. If you just come on a hike with me and you just think flowers are beautiful, A-OK. -okay. If you want to learn some fun facts and then get a deeper appreciation for it, even better. So just sit back. I will just go as long as you tell me I need to stop because, my goodness, are there a lot of flowers out there? Oh, my goodness. They could go on for hours. This, this picture presentation could go on for hours, and we're not going to do that. 
But we're just going to take a look at a few beauties, what might be popping up right now, and what we can expect in a few weeks. What have you been seeing so far? Anything? Uh, yes, uh, blood root. Blood root is up. Yes, and uh, uh, next, next week. It's going to be wonderful. The, yes. The spring beauties, and there are millions of them yes. out there. It's going to look like snow. Tis the season. Spring, spring beauties. It's going to look great out there. So let's take a look at just a few photos. And again, my hope is that you just enjoy the picture presentation. I like to talk about some of the stories behind them. But uh, I won't belabor the fact either because, again, you can talk about flowers forever if you wanted to. So this is a picture taken at Prophetstown State Park on one of my favorite trails this time of year, Trail 2. It's down by the Overlook Deck. Anybody ever been to that little trail? It's a wonderful little trail. It's not terribly long. It has the perfect hillside slope, so it means it gets good drainage and it gets the best sunlight. Certain wildflowers like certain aspects of hillsides, and this one gets it. And so the flowers that you see there are pretty, uh, pretty varied and very beautiful. So it is about this time of year. Actually, it was about three or four weeks ago, you know, middle February. I start getting a little cabin fever. I'm sick of winter, even though I love winter. I'm sick of it, and I'm ready for spring. Spring came a little early this year, so I didn't have to wait too long. But normally I have to wait for the snow to go away in order for me to appreciate wildflowers. But luckily there is one out there that doesn't make me wait very long. In fact, I can go out in the snow and not have to look very hard to find it. This one is an unusual wildflower because its flower comes up before its leaves, which is almost backwards in the flower world. Its flower comes up first. Does anybody know what flower I'm talking about? And you don't get to guess because you probably know. <laughs> comes up first. And you know, if this flower is up and it's a nice sunny day, even though it's a wintry day, you often might get a whiff of it before you see it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage, excellent. I saw somebody else mouth it in the back. Skunk cabbage is a wonderful little flower because it is so unique. Skunk cabbage has the ability to actually melt the snow away from its flowering body. And I took this photo on a very snowy day. It had put a blanket over this hillside where the skunk cabbage likes to grow. I know exactly where it likes to grow because it likes it really wet. So I always know to go there and look. But there was an absolute blanket on the ground except for these little dots, these little holes. And when I walked up and leaned over the hole, I got a glimpse of my first wildflower in middle February. I mean, what a joy to see it. And so this skunk cabbage starts to, again, melt the snow away from it. And why would a flower need to open up the snow above it. If you're coming out really early in the springtime or the late winter, what is it, what is your hope? What do you need to have happen to you that's so important? Sunshine. You need the sunshine to get to you. And if you want to get reproduced for the next year, you also need to, you need to be pollinated. So the insects have to be able to get to you. And so that melting of the snow away allows the sunshine and the insects to get to you, even at that really vulnerable time, which is middle to late winter. So it melts away and you get the skunk cabbage flower. Very unusual. It's maybe about the size of my hand. It's quite large and it's that maroon shape. And being maroon shaped also helps it. You know, if you're a flower, you want all the insects to come to you. Because of its name skunk cabbage, how lovely of a smell do you think this is? <laughs> to a human nose, not very lovely, but to an insect's nose, is stinking a good thing? Yeah, man, if you've ever gone to a, a trash can or a dumpster, insects love stinky stuff, and so if you stink better, you get a better chance of being pollinated. And if you're this really gross maroon color, which looks like dead flesh, you are also an attractive thing to an insect. This flower goes to all lengths to get pollinated because it comes out at a really vulnerable time when there's still snow on the ground. So the beautiful skunk cabbage, when that flower has finished blooming, it's time for its leaves to come on. It's very unique. And those leaves end up being almost the size of elephant ears, just huge. They pop out of these wet areas. This is when it really starts to stink. You break one of these leaves, one of these cabbage looking leaves, and this is where you get the skunk flavor. And this is one of my first experiences with a wild flower or a wild plant 
that I needed to learn whether or not native people ate. When I worked at Mounds State Park, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this story, I tell it every single time I see the skunk cabbage, that when I started at Mounds State Park, which also has a native people's history to it, I went on to the very first hike with my coworker and I said, oh, skunk cabbage. Oh, I read about this in a book. You can eat it, right? And he goes, yeah, I think you can eat it. And I go, are you sure you can eat it? And he goes, yeah, I think you can eat it. So I thought, okay, well, my badge does say naturalist, so let's give it a try. I tore off a leaf. I ate it. It tasted as bad as it smelled, which is very skunky. And I wasn't going to bring it here today because it would really fill this room and gross everybody out. But I ate it. And all I could think of after that point, because we continued on our hike, was that, boy, I should have brought my book with me that said whether or not I really could eat it. Because when you look in that book, it has a skull and crossbones next to anything you're not supposed to eat. And boy, I was really hoping that wasn't the case. As we kept on our hike, though, I didn't say to my coworker, but I kind of picked up the speed to get back to the office because my mouth started feeling pretty funny. And when I got to my office and pulled that book out, I opened it up to skunk cabbage. Whew, no skull and crossbones next to it, so I'm not going to die. But I wanted to read further because I couldn't figure out what was going on in my mouth. And what I read was, you cannot eat skunk cabbage when it's green and fresh. It has a crystal that flows throughout its leaf system called calcium oxalate and will embed itself in the fleshy parts of your mouth and tongue. And in the book, it says specifically, may cause burning and stinging sensation for hours, which is exactly what I experienced. So that was my absolute first experience with eating a wild plant. So it's not enough to know that it is a nutritious and delicious plant, but I would also have had to have known how to eat it. And that is something that always reminds me about how people lived off the land, how native people were so smart about what they ate. This is a very nutritious plant. You just have to be smart about it. And like I said, it's something that gets me through the winter months knowing that the beautiful spring wildflowers are on their way. Skunk cabbage. This is already up, so I'm excited about it. This beautiful little one, and you have to know that when you see a picture presentation, nothing is to scale. Those green leaves, like I said, were going to be about the size of elephant ears versus this beautiful little wildflower, which is maybe the size of a 50 cent piece maybe a little clementine orange, very tiny. But it too, like its name says, snow trillium, comes up this time of year. It does not get very big because it, it uh, is out during the cold months, but it is a beauty that you get to see on the trail. And I have in parentheses here the word leaves because I always want people to know that a lot of these beauties you can eat. This one, there's no caveats to it. Just pick the leaves and eat them, they're really delicious. But any plant that starts with the three letters T-R-I, is probably indicating what unique characteristic? Three, try, you got it. And so with any of the trilliums, you've got three petals, you've got three leaves, and you've got the three sepals that kind of hold it up. All of the trilliums have that unique feature, but this is the first but tiniest of the trilliums. And you can see they, they kind of grow in clumps. Have you seen any snow trilliums? They're really far and few between in this area, yeah. Obviously something called harbinger of spring. Harbinger means that you're welcoming the springtime in. It's also called salt and pepper, and you can see why. It's a cute little white and black flower. When I take some people on wildflower hikes, do they ever get excited about harbinger of spring? Not usually, because it's so tiny. Like this entire flower is again about the size of a quarter. If not, so I get all excited. I get down there and I'm looking at this and I'm telling everybody, oh, look, get excited. Come on, let's go see this. And again, it's about the size of a quarter. So some people don't get quite as crazy as I do. But again, when you're looking for something to welcome you to the springtime, even the tiniest stuff is beautiful stuff. So harbinger of spring. And the tuber, the little root system, is what you can eat on this one. Another picture of salt and pepper. This is kind of like just a virtual hike, if you will. This is the, this is the flowers, this is the hike. Do you still do hikes, don't you? Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. If you were to go on a hike with him or a hike with me, you would be following this beautiful line of flowers. And just like, again, the season tells you, it is spring, and there are spring beauties popping up all over. I did a fourth grader school program yesterday 
in Beach Grove, Indiana. Never been to Beach Grove, Indiana in my life. It's around Indianapolis. And they were learning about Indiana history, Indiana, land of the Indians. So of course I wanted to teach them about foods that were available. And this is uh, one of my favorites that I like for kids to eat. It kind of tastes like a raw potato that's a little dirty, <laughs> if you can get that vision in your head. But the kids thought it was just cool as all get out. So they ate beautiful little flowers called Spring Beauty. And these are everywhere. You said by the hundreds, the thousands, my goodness, the millions there across Indiana. Here's one that also takes a chance coming up early. In fact, all these wildflowers do that. You can see it's starting to unfurl out of the leaf litter. Leaf litter helps them stay a little bit insulated because, again, they're taking a chance coming this early. But as this flower unfurls, you are rewarded with this. Now, its name, if you're just looking at the flower, is a little deceptive because this one is called, did anybody catch it? It was listed up top. What was it called? Bloodroot. bloodroot. Yeah, and you look at the flower and go, why is it called bloodroot? But of course, that indicator is that its root is a gorgeous blood red color. Not for eating, because typically things in nature that are red are, are poisonous, typically. But this one can be used as a beautiful dye. But this gorgeous flower, get a glimpse of it when you see it, because if a really strong wind or really hard rain comes along, every petal gets knocked off this. It's actually a fragile little flower, but it is wonderful. And these are out right now, just in a few numbers I've seen, but they are fixing to come in full force. I can't wait to see hundreds of them. Blood root. Here is that root that's in, in deep in the ground, but a great dye for fabrics, for yarn, for basketry. And of course, native people knew that and used it. Here's another trillium, prairie trillium. We have lots of different trilliums, but again, everything in three. Three leaves, three sepals, three petals. Again, a very tasty one. You know, a lot of green things that you can eat in the wild just taste like grass. I like to pick out the ones that actually taste like something, and this one's a good tasting one. When you go on trail two, you notice that half of the trilliums are missing their leaves. That's because probably me and a group of 30 Girl Scouts just walked through there and ate everything. <laughs> We're like a little group of goats. We're like goats. We just walk on the trail and eat everything. Um, but it's because you can. You're with somebody who is showing you the way. But here's the thing when it comes to eating these flowers. Just like when you go to the grocery store and you pick out the freshest, youngest, most tender things. That's what, when you go to the produce section, you're looking for. The same would be true in the wild. This flower, it's getting ready to have a, um, a bud on it. And this one, which has a bud on it, are the older flowers, maybe a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old plant. This little guy right here, probably just a one-year-old. See, there's no bud in the middle. These woodland wildflowers actually take a few years to mature, so you want that young little tender one. That's the one to eat. We always leave these guys alone and just snack off the youngsters. Fresh and tender, that's what we say in the, in the forest. So trillium. And then, of course, we have our wild geraniums. These aren't up yet. I've not seen a trillium yet, have you, or a geranium? No, we're still a little bit early. Even though spring does seem to have come early, the wildflowers are still on their own schedule. Larkspur, what a beauty. And this photo is not photoshopped. That is the color of that flower. My goodness. And of course, Virginia bluebells. If you have these in your area, you have lots of these in your area. They tend to kind of take over hillsides and you get hundreds of them or thousands of them. I was out on the trail maybe two or three weeks ago and saw one of these and thought, what are you doing out so early? Because I'm kind of showing you photos in sort of a sequential order. And this, that was a little early for a bluebell. But bluebells are gorgeous. They come in several different shades of colors. I was really um, impressed when I went to a program a while back. This was a couple years back. And uh, it was a presenter from Purdue who talked about entomology and bugs and how they were studying this color change from the bluebells. The small little flower that's not open yet, it's not mature, is more pink. And the mature flower, when it wants to open up, turns this nice bluish purple. They wanted to see if that had anything to do with insects. Was there any kind of connection there? And what they found out in their research was that this color shift is actually an indicator for the insect. If your bluebell is still really pink as an insect, 
You're not going to waste your time going to it. You're going to wait as an insect until it's nice and bluish purple. Then I will come over and pollinate you. So that's what Purdue entomologists have, have researchers have studied, is that that color shift is a good indicator for insects. And again, bluebells come in a lot of different shades. Some are a little more blue, some are a little more purple, but they are gorgeous. Wild hyacinth is one that I've been really pleased to get to learn at Prophetstown. Because of all these plants that we know about, native people having eaten, it's been a lot because of oral tradition. The tribal people that I've been able to talk to and connect with, they've told me these stories about them. But this is a plant that we can look up in our archaeological reports that have been shown to have been eaten and their pollen and residue um, is left behind. So beautiful, delicious wild hyacinth. This one is up right now, not the flower, but the leaf is up. Not one of my favorites for eating because it kind of has that peach fuzz consistency. Does anybody else? I see a couple people shaking their head. Ooh, I don't like that either. So it's kind of tasty, but I can't get over the mouth feel of this one. But lots of it. Cutleaf toothwort. It gets that name because of the jagged tooth edge. And I don't think it was on the menu today, but did anybody, does anybody like the spicy ketchup that comes with shrimp cocktail or a shrimp dinner? Does anybody like that? What makes that ketchup kind of spicy? Horseradish. horseradish. If you like horseradish, you'll like eating this one. It's not like spring beauty where you just dig up that little root, clean it off and pop it in your mouth. When you dig up this root, it's about the size of a Tic Tac. And trust me, you want to eat about a third of that because it tastes just like horseradish. But even hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, your food shouldn't be boring because you have plants like this to make everything taste good. So beautiful cut leaf toothwort. And again, these flowers just keep going. Their beauty and their timing, we welcome them every single week because they will change. I like to think of flowers as people I don't get to see every year. These are ephemeral <coughs> flowers, mean, that meaning their time is fleeting. They have just this little window. So I think of flowers as people I only get to see once a year. Because if I miss seeing that blood root, if that heavy rain comes and knocks all the petals off, I have to wait till next year to see them again. And I don't like that at all. So I make sure I get myself out and see them. I don't like to wait to see them. And the same is true with all of these. Beautiful Solomon seal and their dripping flowers that come off the petals. One of my other cool favorites is Dutchman's Bridges. They're a little bit rare at Prophetstown, but I have a couple spots that I can go see them. Kids never get this one. Why this flower is called this? Because they've never heard of the word bridges. What are bridges, Angie? You know, pants. Pants? You call them bridges? Well, yeah. You know, like trousers? Well, what are trousers? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I just say, don't they look like upside-down pants? And they say, I guess I can see that. So, Dutchman's Bridges. What a beautiful, unique flower. Again, a little on the rare side. And this one, of course, is going to start to be poking its head up in a little bit. And there's a group of individuals who are always excited when this one pops up because it indicates the same timing of mushrooms. <laughs> Oftentimes, mushroom hunters will keep their eye out for this because they grow at a similar time. And you saw that that may apple plant does the same thing as bloodroot. I'm going to come out real slow because I don't know if we get a late frost. I'm going to come out real slow. And then when the weather is really nice, it pops open its leaf, and you're rewarded with these, my goodness, almost umbrella-sized uh, leaves. You have to bend over usually to see the flower. But it's that underneath side where the actual apple grows. This isn't, this isn't one that I usually practice eating on because fruit in the wild is a little fickle. You eat it a little early, it's a little too bitter, makes you sick. You eat it a little too late, it's overripe, and it makes you a different kind of sick. So uh, I don't, um, I don't, uh, don't want to be wrong on either end of that, that calendar. So I just say, oh, look at the May apple, and we keep walking. So again... Flowers are beautiful. I want you to get out there, hopefully. Maybe take a tour with Sam. Maybe come to Prophetstown and see yellow trout lily and white trout lily. And the list just keeps going. 
So please get out there and see these friends. That's what I think of them. Friends that I only get to see once a year. Whether they're the dandelions popping up in your yard, or the violets, or the daylilies. My hope is you love flowers just as much as I do. And uh, take the time to snack on them if you have the opportunity. So. so thanks for letting me come out. And please, again, take that brochure on spring wildflowers and look through your own backyard. Um, these aren't all terribly common flowers, or uncommon, so you should have a few of them popping up. Again, whether it's a dandelion or a violet um, or a trillium. Trillium can be pretty common. So enjoy the wildflowers. I sometimes think I'm preaching to the choir. I know there's a lot of smiling faces out there who love flowers too. But again, these are spring wildflowers. When summer comes, you've missed your chance to see them because then summer welcomes its own new flowers. So I hope you'll come out to the park where it's spring, summer, or fall and, and see what we have to show you. Okay? Very good. Thanks for having me out again. Thank you, Angie. <laughs> Diane? I, um, that was a fantastic program, yeah. beautiful photos, and we have a small token of appreciation to help keep you just a little bit organized, oh, although yeah. you seem pretty organized no, to no, me. I need, I need all the help I can get. Can I ask one question just real quick? Yes. Sure. Yes. Somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Yes. I go to the state parks and say, don't disturb anything, but you're saying it's okay to eat them. <laughs> yes, he says you're not supposed to disturb things at the state park. Um, it Yeah. He's teasing, but the fact of the matter is that you are allowed to. We usually just like it if people say, oh, I'm not allowed to touch or disturb anything. But you are allowed to take things that you traditionally can eat. <clears throat> Berries, nuts, mushrooms, uh, pine cones, because there is actual pine nut in there. And we usually add greens, greens like dandelion, stinging nettle, uh, poke leaves.